bread versus sugar. They seem very different, but they're also very similar. You see, bread has a higher glycemic index than sugar, which means as far as the carbohydrate count and how the carbohydrates affect us is concerned, bread might actually be worse than sugar. But in this video, we wanna break down which one's worse for different things. And the reality is, at the end of the day, moderation is key, but we do have to pay attention to the whole hyperglycemic effects of foods. And when you look at bread, bread is interesting because it has to be broken down. You've got these starch chains, and these starch chains have to get broken down into what are called monosaccharides, okay? And these monosaccharides are individual glucose molecules that then elevate our blood glucose. So at first glance, you think, well, sugar is probably worse because sugar is sweet. The interesting thing is, is sugar technically is sucrose and sucrose is technically about 50% glucose and 50% fructose. So that means for every one gram of table sugar that you have, you're actually only getting 0.5 grams of actual glucose that's gonna absorb really quick. The other 0.5 grams is fructose, which has its own issues, which we'll talk about later in this video, but it does not impact insulin the same way. You see, in this world of looking at bread versus sugar, we have to look at, okay, yes, what does it do to our blood glucose? But almost more importantly, what does it do to our insulin levels? And that's where bread can be an issue. And there was a study that was published in the journal Appetite that took a look at bread and it looked at white bread versus whole grain bread versus lupin flour bread. And it wanted to look at just this. It wanted to look at glucose and insulin and all this because with bread, there's so many different categories, right? There's not as many categories with sugar. Bread, you could add anything to bread, various amounts of fiber, various amounts of sugar, all kinds of that in bread. So it's a more complex thing to analyze. Well, with this, they measured their glucose and insulin levels after consuming these three different types of bread. And then they sent them to a buffet two hours later and they wanted to see how much more each group would eat. Well, they found the white bread group ended up consuming about 328 kilojoules, which is about 78 to 80 calories more than the whole grain group. Not an astronomical amount, but it does demonstrate that that glycemic effect did trigger more of an appetite and less satiety. I'm less concerned about that and more concerned about this. The lupin flour bread group ended up only having 6,300 picomoles per liter of insulin produced. Okay, whereas the white bread group produced about 9,600 picomoles per liter of insulin. So we're talking about a 30% increase in insulin being produced. Now, different people are gonna have different opinions on this, but glucose is one thing. That's a problem, having high levels of glucose. But in my humble opinion, having higher levels of insulin is even worse, okay? Because glucose causes damage, definitely. Glycates proteins, there's definitely issues there. Okay, but when insulin levels are chronically high, that is an indicator that your glucose has been high for a very long time, but also insulin is going to impede fat loss if it's elevated all the time, and insulin is going to also trigger more fat accumulation that's going to kind of send you down this vicious cycle. So again, we have to look at the wide variety of breads that can play into this, right? White bread, super high glycemic. That's gonna spike your blood glucose high and give you a high level of insulin. So now let's look at some other things because outside of just the hyperglycemic effect, what about cardiovascular risk? Well, that's where we have to factor this stuff in. You see, when you look at things like sugar, sugar does impact, of course, our glycemic level, like how much our blood sugar is. But if white bread is arguably worse, then maybe white bread is worse from a cardiovascular standpoint. And where do I come from that? Where do I gather that information? Well, there's a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that took a look at over 137,000 people over nine and a half years. And to make a long story short, they ultimately found that people that ate a higher glycemic diet, like lots of white bread and possibly even whole grain bread, which is still pretty high glycemic, ended up having a significantly increased chance of having a cardiac event. Okay, so what's the potential mechanism here? What's happening? Well, when they looked at these people, they did see a couple of things. And this is a very vague, broad way of looking at it. They saw an increase in triglycerides and they saw a decrease in HDL cholesterol. Two very simple things that when we associate them together, end up leading to a hardening of the arteries and sort of a thickening of the arterial wall. Okay, this can make it so you have less oxygen getting to an organ, which would explain why there is an increased risk of a cardiac event. If people have a high levels of blood sugar all the time, which isn't necessarily just associated with literal sugar consumption, but associated with hyperpalatable, hyperprocessed, refined starches that are arguably even worse, 
Well, then yeah, you eventually can starve yourself of oxygen to the organs because the arteries stiffen. But that's somewhat correlation, not always causation, but pretty much all of nutrition is that way. Now, just to put things into context, the cool thing with bread is that bread can have so many different variables in it, right? So let's say, for example, you have a bread that has like just straight white bread, which is basically just straight refined starch that's going to be super high glycemic. Or you have a bread that has psyllium husk in it and it has 10 grams of fiber in it. That's gonna change everything. It also makes it difficult because it's very broad. But here's a random study that just shows how intricate and nuancy things can be. So this particular study looked at polyphenols that were in bread, and it found that some bread with polyphenols might actually be better than others. So the study was published in the journal Nutrition Research, took a look at white bread compared to white bread with green tea extract compared to white bread with baobab extract. Random, right? Okay, what they found is that the white bread and the white bread with green tea had very little difference when it came down to their glucose and their insulin and everything like that. But the white bread with the baobab extract ended up causing a much less increase in insulin. So appetite and glucose were equal among all three bread groups, but insulin was much lower in the baobab group, indicating that somehow the baobab extract ended up making it so that less insulin was required to deal with the glucose. So I come back to my argument. Being able to secrete less insulin is really powerful. Because if you eat 10 grams of carbohydrates, but your body continues to pump out tons of insulin, that's a problem. I would rather you eat 50 grams of carbs and need this much insulin than eat 10 grams of carbs and need this much insulin. It's not all about the carbohydrates. It's all about the metabolic function at the pancreatic level and what works at a cellular level. So the type of bread you eat plays a big role too. I did put a link down below for Thrive Market, which has a variety of different lower carb breads if you wanna try them out. They are a sponsor on this channel, so full disclaimer, but I wanna make sure that I implement things that are practical and make sense with the videos. So the link down below will save you 30% off your entire grocery order, plus you get a free $50 gift. So when you go to Thrive Market, you just sort by low carb or sort by keto, and then you can type in bread. So you'll come up with a bunch of different breads that are going to be lower carb, so you can still get the bread effect, but maybe without the high carbohydrates that you want, or maybe just with more fiber. And if you wanna go the gluten-free route, or just things that don't have a bunch of refined starches, so you can still have bread in your life, but maybe not going the white bread route, where it's arguably worse from a hyperglycemic effect than sugar. So that link is down below, 30% off your entire grocery order, and a $50 free gift. Big thank you to Thrive Market. Now we have to talk about sugar though. You see, here's what's interesting. We've somewhat concluded that white bread and a lot of breads are actually gonna spike your glucose worse than sugar. So does that mean that they're worse than sugar? Well, probably from a hyperglycemic effect, yes, they possibly are. And I'm not condoning sugar, but sugar might work in different directions. For example, from a mental health perspective, from a depression side of things, let's look at some observational data. There's a study that was published in Scientific Reports, took a look at 8,000 people over 22 years. And this study demonstrated that on average, in this particular case, men that had 67 grams of sugar or more per day had a 23% higher chance of developing depression. And this was almost entirely erased if they were below 40 grams of sugar per day. That's interesting. What's the mechanism here? Because it's not necessarily related to blood sugar. I mean, I'm sure that plays a part, but there's something else going on. And when you look at the mechanistic data, you start understanding that, okay, when sugar is consumed in high amounts, it can stimulate the liver to release these liver fatty acids, okay? And these fatty acids, once digested and broken down, can lead to an inflammatory response. This inflammatory response can certainly play a role when it comes down to mental health. Anxiety, depression, there is correlation there with inflammation in terms of how we feel and how our brain even operates. And especially when you get down into brain inflammation and the ability for our neurons to communicate with one another, very important pieces. So it looks like sugar might be operating kind of down a different continuum because yes, sugar is bad for your blood sugar, but a lot of these starches are worse and they're not as correlated with depression acutely or directly as say sugar is. Then we look at the fatty liver piece. Now this is interesting because there was a study that was published in the Journal of Hepatology, took a look at over 5,900 people, okay? And in this particular case, they measured sugar consumption via like sugary beverages versus diet beverages, and then a liver marker known as alanine transaminase. When you look at alanine transaminase, you can see 
how someone's liver fat is developing. Like this alanine transaminase really tells you a lot about fatty liver. What they found with this is that people that consumed the sugary beverages had a significantly higher amount of alanine transaminase compared to those that consumed diet sodas, even if their calories were about the same. So this is fascinating because this tells us that has something to do with the sugar. But then you start breaking it down and you understand, you're like, well, okay, if you look at glucose and sugar itself, it doesn't have a huge impact on fatty liver, but what can is fructose. Now, this is where we get kind of granular, and it's very important that we pay close attention to this because fructose is not just an overall enemy, it's not the end of the world. As a matter of fact, there's good things that come with fructose. Fructose does not spike insulin. And remember what I was saying earlier in this video, like we don't want these big insulin spikes, so fructose could work in our advantage. However, but fructose has to be dealt with at the liver level. We do not have GLUT5 transporters. We do not have the ability to transport fructose into a muscle cell. It has to be metabolized in the liver, which means that once the liver is full, fructose can no longer be dealt with and it stores as fat at the liver level. This number in the amount of fructose that we can handle varies widely from 30 grams to 100 grams, depending on the size of the person, the hepatic glycogen storage, all of this, so it's very difficult to say. But when you take someone that is consuming lots of sodas that contain a high amount of fructose and contain high fructose corn syrup, concentrated amounts of fructose, yes, it is no surprise that you would start seeing elevated levels of alanine transaminase. Okay, so we have to back this out a little bit more and understand fatty liver, just so that we're being very honest here. There's a study that was published in the International Journal of Vitamin and Nutritional Research, and it took a look at glucose versus fructose as far as uh, how it was consumed and its effect on insulin, because this is very important. Okay, they found that when they took pure glucose, pure sugar, like pure glucose, like you would find in like say white bread, right? When they put that directly into what is called intraduodenal, directly into the duodenum, into the small intestinal area, right above the small intestine, or orally, there was a huge spike in insulin. With fructose, just fructose, whether it was oral or intraduodenal, there was practically no insulin spike, okay? This is good and bad once again. My point in saying this is that moderate amounts of sugar might actually be safer than even moderate amounts of bread in a lot of ways because you're buffered by having a little bit of fructose. If you look at fruits, for example, there are a good number of fruits that have sucrose, fructose, and glucose in them, okay? So they have these things. Does that mean that that fruit is a adulterated garbage thing that you should never eat? No, moderate amounts, right? Whereas you look at bread, it's a hyper palatable, very satisfying from a mental side of thing, and it's ultra refined in a very unnatural way. So I'm not trying to totally throw bread under the bus, but we look at refined sugar and sure, that's refined and that's not good and it's stripped of nutrients. But when we look at sugar in its natural form, I would say that sugar in its natural form is even better than a refined starch that is so much of a bolus of glucose that our body can't handle it. And if you look at it metabolically, not just from an inflammatory standpoint, it looks like bread is probably worse. But at the end of the day, if you put yourself in a deficit and you control for your overall length of time between meals and you control your glucose by moving a lot, I think you can have a fair bit of flexibility. I'm a little bit biased because I sit in the low carb camp and I try to limit my sugar intake and I try to limit my refined starches. But as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.